Hi and welcome back history fans to another reaction video where we try to learn something new and to spread history on YouTube. Okay, so today we have the video called A Complete History of World War I in Country Balls. So uh, basically I love the concept of Country Balls. This video was uh, recommended in the comment sections below and I decided to take it up. If you want to be part of our community, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And we have also a Discord server, you can join there, the link is going to be in the description below. And also, as always, um, the original video is also in the description below. Uh, go give the creator a view and a like. And yeah, let's just jump in into the video. As always, you can give your uh, opinions, thoughts, because this video is, what, uh, almost 12 minutes long and I don't want to make a video that's, I don't know, 3-4 hours long because nobody's going to watch until the end, so I'm just gonna uh, give some thoughts on some things in the video. If you have some additional information, corrections, whatever, uh, let your voice be heard in the comment section and you can also suggest videos for me to watch there. Of course, history related. Okay, let's jump into the video. Here's 1914. This nice and clean map of Europe has a lot more dirt than you might think it does, and it's only going to get messier from here. So what is going on now, what was going on before, and what is going to happen later? Spoilers, a fight breaks out and destroys a good chunk of everybody. Yeah, kinda true. So let's look back a little bit before the year 1914 and the year 1912. The region in Southeast Europe known as the Balkans was always a hot mess. Let's look at one kingdom here, Serbia. This one, as of now, fairly small kingdom has an undying urge to expand. When they failed in taking a region with a high population of Serbs, Bosnia, they looked south. And what is actually south of them? Just a ton of their Christian pals that are waiting to escape the Muslim Empire. This is the Ottoman Empire, who doesn't have a very good reputation with the rest of the gang here, so everybody has a little bit of a score to settle with them. The four kingdoms of Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, and Montenegro band together, and the Balkan League is assembled, ready to take the Ottomans out of Europe, and on October of 1912, they begin their attack. To say the very least, this did not end well for the... Yeah, so he begins with the Balkan Wars. Yeah, those, are, those were the wars uh, for the independence of the Balkan nations. So, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro... Okay, Montenegro wasn't... Uh, under the direct rule of the Ottoman Empire, but especially Greece and Albania become, became also independent. Uh, but the thing that you need to know uh, on the Balkans is a lot of people have a lot of relatives and family connections outside of the state's, board, state's borders or national borders, let's say it that way. And it always led to conflict. So, of course, all the uh, the different uh, like states, like, I don't know, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, and so on, they want to incorporate all those regions where maybe a Greek uh, or Greeks live, or Bulgarians live, or Serbs live, and so on. So it's actually a normal thing. But uh, especially in the Balkans, Balkan Wars, we will see that Bulgaria isn't happy with, the, of course, the Turks aren't, uh, happy with that with the outcome especially losing uh, Adrianople uh, that's here approximately uh, a big and important Ottoman city uh, and but but the Bulgarians weren't happy with the outcome of the first Balkan war so they will try to to annex these territories where today's uh, North Macedonia is but yeah let's move on yeah, and especially and especially they they weren't happy that the Greeks took the city of Thessaloniki uh, in today's Greece, so they were also unhappy because they also wanted that city. All four kingdoms took a nice chunk of land with them, and now there's an independent state, yeah. Albania. Even though massive gains were made on the Balkan League side, the largest and most powerful kingdom, Bulgaria, was not pleased with their share of a region known as Macedonia to the people who live there, and former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to the people who or don't North live there. Macedonia today. Bulgaria invades their former best friends in June of 1913. We'll fight for this land that is rightfully ours, and we shall be remembered for it. Victory belongs to us, the people of Bulgaria. They failed and gave up in a month. So now we have a yep. collapsing empire trying to survive. One kingdom displeased with their war profits. One kingdom attempting to unite all Serbs, but a bit north of them. A huge empire who is still holding Bosnia, full of Serbia's people. 
Everyone get mad, because Serbia isn't stopping. In late June of 1914, a Serbian nationalist by the name of Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. A month later... Yeah, he... Uh, he was... Uh, so, Gavrilo Princip, he was a Serb living in side of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and he was part of a uh, group called Crna Ruka, or... Uh, uh, black hand and their idea was to unite the southern slavs into one state but they had also uh um like kind of uh ambitions to make a great serbia so to not incorporate other other nationalities in the state in a sense of being equal but to expand uh, the territory of serbia but yeah he eventually killed franz ferdinand in sarajevo but that's a whole other story. Uh, but interesting fact, so he was actually very young, I think he was 18, and by that law, although Franz Ferdinand was the th uh, uh, heir of the Habsburg monarchy, so he's the next in line to, to get the throne, uh, his idea, Franz Ferdinand was actually prone to the idea of uh, making uh, a third ethnicity inside of Austria-Hungary. So as the name implies, the main countries inside of that state were Austria and Hungary and all the other different nationalities like Czechs, Slovaks, uh, Poles, uh, Slovenians, Serbs and so on. Uh, so all the other minor minority groups, let's call them that way, but they were all Slavs. So he was actually kind of in favor of uh, making uh, that uh, monarchy into a not a dual monarchy but a but a three-part monarchy let's let's say that way war breaks out between austria hungary and serbia directly after russia declares war on austria hungary for declaring war on serbia afterwards germany yeah but okay i will try not to stop that much <laughs> we're only at two minutes yeah but uh after the assassination uh people also uh, also uh, so in Austria-Hungary, the politicians say, okay, the Black Hand, so Gavrilo, Gavrilo Princip, was in coordination with the Serbian politicians, so the parliament. Uh, the Serbs deny it. They have an inquiry into that. And they say, no, there weren't any connections, although there were some, some, some generals connected with providing weapons to, to that organization. But there wasn't an official, you know, like support for that organization. Uh, and then... Austria-Hungary gets an ultimatum to Serbia, and you can look it up. Look it up what the ultimatum was, but it was um, that's, uh, that that Austria-Hungary can um, can kind of control or uh, investigate inside of Serbia, so they would uh, also be able to uh, to 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 let's call it invade, I, I cannot find the right, right word, but invade into Serbia's judiciary and the Serbs needed to reply in, I don't know, one, two days. So, yeah, a, a lot of historians actually ag agree that Austria-Hungary just made an ultimatum that Serbia cannot agree upon. It's that easy. He declares war on Russia for declaring war on Austria-Hungary for declaring war on Serbia. Second to lastly, France declares war on Germany for declaring war on Russia. Just a quick note, Serbia and Russia are in good relationships. Both are orthodox, uh, uh, like their main religion is orthodox Christianity. And Serbia, a few decades ago, uh, uh, be became like the protector or of orthodox Christians in Europe and throughout the world. Like uh, Sweden was with the Protestants, like Charlemagne with, was with... Roman Catholics and so on. So uh, the the Russians were always thinking about, yeah, we need to uh, help Orthodox Christian brothers and so on. But Russia yeah. for declaring war on Austria, Hungary for declaring war on Serbia. Now, finally, UK declares war on Germany and Austria, Hungary because that's what friends do. So let's get started. I think that they actually declared war after German. They, they declared. No, this is false. Like, they declared war, actually, uh, when Germany invaded France through through Luxembourg and Belgium, because Belgium was an ally of Great Britain, and 
Belgium was a neutral country, but because the border between France and Germany was so overwhelmingly like uh, militarized with bunkers on the French side and so on, they just said, okay, we go through Belgium, but that eventually uh, brought the, the Belgians uh, or the British to the Belgium side and to declare war in Germany. France and Germany weren't at good terms even before this war began. Oh As a result, God, the direct border was heavily guarded, minutes. but Germany didn't exactly <laughs> plan on playing by the rules. Since going under, over, or through the border wasn't an effective option, why just go around it? Following this train yep. of thought is exactly what Germany did. In early August of 1914, Germany went on to attack through Luxembourg and Belgium in order to get to France. While their initial attack was effective, they stopped advancing by September and found themselves locked in a stalemate. Both sides dug trenches and stopped moving until late March of 1917. So as the British might say, let's skip across the pond for a moment to see how the U.S. is doing. Attempting to stay neutral. neutral, they just see this war as a distant tragedy that shouldn't involve them in any way, but now they're feeling a bit bad for Belgium who got trampled on by German troops. Because of this, Herbert Hoover... The invasion of Belgium was a big thing because Germans were depicted throughout, and Germans did atrocities in Belgium, but uh, uh, the international media got caught, got wind of it, and they depicted the Germans as uh, as you know, barbaric and, and everything else. So, but the American public didn't want to intervene in Europe because, you know, like, we we don't want to get involved into that European mess. Uh, but eventually they will join the war on the Allies side. Who will later become the president of the U.S., organize the... And also with the invasion of Belgium, uh, the U.S. had always a big influx of German migrants or people with German background and so on. And after the invasion of Belgium, you can see how the uh, um, American Germans or German American uh, German Americans how they uh, were assimilated more and more. So they gave up their culture and everything because they didn't want to be identified with the barbarism that the German Germans did in Belgium. The Commission for Relief in Belgium where supplies needed for a living that generally most Belgians did not have at this point were brought to them. Other than this, however, the US was having a jolly okay time taking stuff over in the Pacific like the rest of the Europeans would have. So, with that being said, things in the Americas are pretty calm as of now. Now let's go back to Europe to look at Serbia and Austria-Hungary and what they're up to. Nothing. Nothing. For the first entire year of the war, very few advances had occurred between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Yep. Even though these two were at each other's throats during the first couple of days, Austria-Hungary's priority changed quickly as Russia started gnawing on their eastern border. The front lines here were back in... One thing about the two fronts. So, Germany... Okay, Russia had the biggest standing army in Europe. Uh, Germany's idea, or, or the known Schlieffen plan, uh, um, their main idea or main focus wa was, okay... We will attack France first, capture Paris, because Paris is the main main city and everything for France. When we capture that, we will uh, get rid of the Western Front and then we uh, focus on Russia, because Russia needs time to, uh, to mobilize their troops. That didn't happen, uh, so they fought a two-pronged war against Russia and... Uh, and France and, and Great Britain at the same time, but they also fought Serbia, and Serbia repelled, I think, three times the Austro-Hungarian army, but eventually, with Bulgaria joining the army, Serbia was overwhelmed, uh, overwhelmed with... with Fourth, Germany and Austria-Hungary only began making significant gains after a counteroffensive took place during May of 1915. Now, who are we forgetting about? The Ottomans, of course. Let's not forget about the Ottomans who joined the war on the 29th of October of 1914. They were just a tad late to the party, but they stayed up until the very end. Upon their arrival, they were met with a quick 2x4 to the back of their head, also known as an invasion. Whatever you want to call it, it was quickly repelled by mid-November. The Ottomans went a bit further and decided to attempt to invade Russia in mid-winter, but just like before, this attack was repelled the next month. The Ottomans were not entirely happy with this move. On top of an empire that is collapsing due to problems with ethnic diversity, now they have a bruised military force. Uh, Armenians, they will do atro atrocities against Armenians uh, in the First World War. Uh, and also, you need to take into account, the Ottoman Empire is not the same as today's Turkey. Yeah, 
Turks were a big part of the Ottoman Empire, but the Ottoman Empire, like the Austrian Hungarian Empire or monarchy, was a very diverse empire. So you always need to take that into account. Force and can't fight as well on foreign soil. So, like any logical thinker of the 1480s, they walked right into ethnic Armenian territory and proceeded to <laughs> do things that would probably get my video blocked in modern day Turkey. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, as of May of 1915, let's take a look at the standings. Russia and the Ottomans are running into a stalemate. Serbia and Austria Hungary are still at a stalemate, and Germany and France have not moved at all. But now Germany is advancing into Russian territory faster than before. Between May and October, Germany had entirely captured the Duchy of Warsaw and is making quick moves into Russia's Baltic holdings. Just as things have really started to heat up between Germany and Russia, Serbia is seeing their last couple of months in this war. On the other hand, US is getting really mad about Germany sinking the favorite boat, the Lusitania. The US is starting to reconsider being yeah. neutral in this conflict, and this is about the second to last straw they can hold before it breaks their back. So the main idea of the, of the Germans was, uh, yeah, the US is supplying Great Britain, so their enemy, and if somebody is... But, but the U.S. is saying that uh, they're staying neutral. But if you send supplies to, you know, like an enemy, is he really neutral or not? That's always the, like, the question that has no real answer to it. But yeah. Same but Lu uh, Lusitania was probably one of the uh, big turning points when the U.S. public was starting to get more and more pro-war. Remember Bulgaria? So pro yeah, Bulgaria remembers Bulgaria. On yeah. October 14th, 1915, the previously mentioned Bulgaria, who was still disappointed about the outcome of the last Balkan War, decided to take the opportunity of seeing Serbia completely vulnerable and united in cooperation with Austria-Hungary. Yeah. Within two months, Serbia was destroyed. Bulgaria made off with a good chunk of their they land, but Serbia wasn't entirely finished. So I hope you were following before, no because I'll warn too. you, it only gets more confusing from here on out. Within the last couple of days, Serbia's army evacuated into neighboring Albania and Greece and continued fighting from there. Yeah. So, with mainland Serbia defeated, the and the Austro-Hungarians uh, did uh, a lot of uh, uh, atrocities against Serbian civilians, and Serbia was actually the country, uh, percentage-wise, to lose uh, the most in population. The war should end, right? Well, unfortunately, no. Europe has already turned into a melting pot of chaos and they're not showing any sign of stopping. Everyone had done enough to piss each other off, it seems, and now they all have a score to settle. A score they can only settle with more- no! <laughs> A lot more blood is to be bled, so let's keep bleeding, shall we? Ever since the defeat of Serbia, things have slowed down until April when Russia decided to drop a few more 2x4s on the Ottomans' heads. And then in June, Russia took back land from the Germans. Making a bit of a comeback, Romania joined the Allies in late August of 1916 and invaded Austria-Hungary. It went nicely out. until September when Bulgaria attacked from the south, diverting Romania's attention. Yeah. Romania was fought out of Austria-Hungary through October, and through the next three months proceeded to be steamrolled. So besides Romania being steamrolled, and the fact that this is a war of course, things are actually getting pretty quiet. This relative silence would all be ruined when Germany decided to poke the US with a stick once again. On January 19th of 1917, Germany attempted to send a telegram to Mexico, but the message was intercepted by the UK and was forwarded to the US. Oh, the this was known as the Zimmerman Telegram. Germany, who was afraid of the US becoming too powerful, wanted something to distract the US from Europe. In this telegram, Germany essentially said, Hey Mexico, if you want to help me destroy the US, I'll help you get your land back from that war you had. Of course. Yeah, so so Germans pro um, promised Mexico to give uh, to give back them uh, today's territory of, of, of Texas and New Mexico. And I'm not that good with US geography, but but I think it's Arizona. Or or what is the what is the uh, name of the state but oh, anyway to give this territory back to mexico if they join the german side and the zimmerman telegraph was definitely the last troll the, that broke the camel's back um and yeah eventually the brits intercepted it and of course they wanted to drive the u.s into the war because of the big industrial power that the u.s was already back then and eventually yeah the the u.s accepted Mexico's never getting a say in this since the US received the telegram before yep. Mexico did. 
too bad for Germany, who is trying to reach out to make a new but friend. Mexico because after receiving this telegram, the United States declared war on Germany. So now while the U.S. is gearing up for battle, Europe is just now thawing out from doing pretty much nothing all winter. The action would kick start after France won the Battle of Verdun. 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 And began making gains against the Germans in March. But after a short time, they got stuck again. Much more drawn out mustard gas attacks, trench foot, massacres, and vomiting ensues throughout the entire year. Fast forward to November of 1917, and Russia spontaneously has a revolution. There's communists now, and they want to overthrow the Russian government. Now Russia has to fight the Ottomans, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and now they have to fight themselves too. Of yep. course, nobody can fight in Siberia except for Russia the during the winter, army. but Russia's already fighting, fighting with Russia, so it. obviously Russia does not stand a chance. In December, Russia capitulates. They pull out of the war, but they end up paying a massive yes, exit fee. Treaty. Signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Russia loses Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Livonia, Lithuania, Finland, Poland, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, 25% of their population, 90% of their coal industry, and they pay 6 million German marks for damages. Quickly, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottomans rush in <laughs> to occupy the surrendered territories. Nice. Even though Russia as a whole had already surrendered, these territories were still not entirely calmed down since the surrender, and small battles would still be taking place. As a result, it took most of the Central Powers troops to secure... Yes, yeah, so the question was, uh, at the beginning of the war, like in every conflict, the general population is highly motivated. So they think they're gonna win until Christmas, you know, like also uh, the big uh, the saying that was during World War Two. So we were will until uh, when when Christmas comes and so on. In one month we're back home and so on. But as the as the war progresses, as more and more wounded men come back, as more and more people died in the conflicts, um, and we need to take into account that every every country that was involved in this war put their last economic efforts everything every penny into the war effort so the general population was starving they didn't have food supplies whatever and the question was always which country is going or which population of which country would break first and it was russians and of uh, and the interesting thing is the Germans, actually, uh, Lenin was in Switzerland back then, and the Germans sent troops to get Lenin, and they actually orchestrated uh, to bring back Lenin to St. Petersburg and to, to Russia to start the revolution to knock out Russia uh, out of the war. So, actually, they succeeded. Hear this land. Because of this, they were even weaker on every other active front. If you think this would make the U.S. think twice, uh, look up, look up. And small battles would still be taking place. Austro front troops to secure the this. Austro-Hungarian and Italian Italian front. It's pretty amazing fighting there because of the Al Alps uh, and, and the Tehran there. And look up uh, Svetozar Borojevic von Banja, or Boina. Um, he was named uh, the Lion of Socha or Isonzo. Uh, that's a river that flows through today's Italy and Slovenia. But very interesting. And as I said, uh, um, Austria-Hungary had a diverse uh, eth ethnic mix. So, uh, and here is Slovenia. So what the Aust Austrians would do, they would send those ethnic groups who were like on the fronts, they would send them to the Italian front because they thought those troops are going to be more motivated to defend because, you know, like your village or your city is, I don't know, behind you, like five or ten kilometers. So you're motivated to, to keep the enemy out of that village. So a lot of, of, the, of the Italian Austro-Hungarian front was um, uh, manned with, with Slovenes, Croats and Austrians. Pretty interesting land. story. Look because it up. of this, they were even weaker on every other active front. If you think this would make the U.S. think twice about trying to fight Germany, who just capitulated a giant bear not long ago, then you would be wrong. 
In January of 1918, the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson outlines what is called the 14 Points, a set of principles that could be put into place after the war They're to ensure peace remaining in Europe, and that history. further conflict over basically the same things would be avoided. Simplified, they are as followed. Section 1. There will be no secret treaties. If two or more countries have to agree to something, you bet everybody else is going to know they agreed to it. Section 2. Yeah, it was freedom of access to the sea, whether during decide. times of peace or times of war. Essentially, this is a discreet way of telling Germany that sinking everybody's boats in international water was not a very nice thing to do. Yeah. Section 3. The establishment of free trade. You can probably imagine that people would stop selling guns to each other if they knew that the buyer was going to use the guns on them. The economic immobility that took place during World War I also restricted a lot of trade of food. Because of this, there is a pretty significant famine everywhere. Section 4. Yeah, the provokers of this war will have their armies dulled down to use defense forces. Of course, it isn't totally necessary to spend more than 10% of your entire gross domestic product just to build more killing machines. Yeah, everything was right? put Section down. 5. The Empire's <laughs> colonial claims will be adjusted, or in other terms, the Allies are going to take the Central Powers colonies for... Yeah, we always... we I mean, uh, the most bloodbath uh, was, uh, was done in Europe, on the European continent, but as it was a world war, we always need to take into uh, consideration also the fighting that was happening in uh, uh, New Zealand, that was ha happening in Africa, so the colonies of the, of the uh, respected sides, so yeah. For themselves, these will be administered in what are called mandates later. Section 6, the Russian territories will be evacuated, and afterwards everyone will let Russia decide their own fate in the ongoing civil war. Unfortunately. Stalin. Section 7. Germany, seriously, get out of Belgium, that's illegal. Yeah. Section 8. Germany should probably also get out of France. About 50 years prior to this war, Germany had taken over Alsace-Lorraine. France was mad and so was everybody else, apparently. Section 9. Italy will be adjusted so that anyone deemed an Italian would be within their borders. This mainly concerns Austria-Hungary, but surprisingly not San Marino. Section 10. Austria-Hungary, the beautiful patchwork of different languages and ethnicities, is to let all these other ethnicities decide what they want to do for themselves. Or in freedom terms, we'll give them independence. Section 11. Uh, regarding the Italian peace, uh, uh, look up what Italy should have gotten after the Second World War, uh, uh, after the First World War, and what they got. So, they should have got this uh, part, Tirol. Uh, they got it. They should have got this territory in today's Slovenia and Croatia, so Istria, they got that also. But they were also promised this part, so Dalmatia, uh, and they didn't got it because eventually all the Yugoslavs, so Croats, Serbs, Slovenes, uh, and people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they would form a state which will later on very quickly join with Serbia into uh, Yugoslavia later on uh, and because of because Serbia was a winning party in the First World War they could say no to Italy uh, and keep those uh, the coastline the Dalmatian coastline and because Serbia had still a standing army Romania but yeah uh, Hungary was the the the, the country that lost, I think, 60% of their territory. So they were uh, the hardest hit. Serbia and Montenegro are to be got out of by the Central Powers and have their stolen territories given back to them. Serbia will be given free, undisturbed access to the sea. Balkans will be organized along lines of national allegiance, and independence yep. will be guaranteed for all of them. Nice job. Section 12, the Ottoman Empire will be partitioned along lines of ethnicity. The Turkish majority portion will be given independence as its own Turkish nation, while other ethnicities will be given the right to decide to rule amongst themselves. Just like Kurdistan, I'm sure. The yeah. section also promises that the Turkish Straits will be internationally administered and will... Uh, Dardanelles and Bosporus, those are very important. So here's Turkey, here's Istanbul. You need to take into account also the uh, the Gallipoli Front, which was very important and a big blunder for the Allies during the First World War. Uh, Churchill uh, was the main sponsor of it. He got... Uh, uh, he uh, had... That was a big negative publicity on him because uh, that campaign eventually... Uh, fell or wasn't successful and the person who got the most out of it was uh, Ke um, 
what was his name? Uh, Atatürk. I mean, Kemal Pasha. Kemal Pasha. Atat I forgot. I always forget his whole name. But Atatürk. So the first Turkish president, and he was the main guy on the Turkish or or the Ottoman side who would uh, defeat uh, the the Allied. Um, force that invaded uh, Gallipoli and they needed to 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 make this path free so they could trade arms and everything with the Russian allies so Russia is here and here's the Mediterranean and then they could go to to Britain and France be open to anybody sailing through section 13 a Polish state will be given independence in areas that are undeniably majority Polish they will also be given access to the sea and a promise of undisturbed independence. Oh, if only they could predict the future. Hmm. And finally, Section 14, the League of Nations will be formed as an organization made up of great powers who will assure that everyone will be able to maintain their independence and that generally stuff gets enforced. Even though the United States has made a pretty confident statement about the future of the world, the Central Powers still kept at it. After spending most of 1918 trying to secure the land that fell off the Russian Empire, the US had already deployed to France and began driving the Germans out. On the last day of September 1918, Bulgaria surrenders. On the last day of October of the same year, and the Ottomans lay down their arms. The 3rd of November, and austria hungary recoils in fear as they are attacked from all sides. And of November 11th, Germany is finished. And thus, a victory was secured for the Allies. Surely this can't be the end, can it? Do not worry, because at least 17 million people did not die for no reason. The world is going to look a whole lot different from now on. So now let's look at how Europe will be reshaped. First, a look at Austria-Hungary, which went from a beautiful stained glass window to a harmful, <laughs> bloody, and ugly pointy mess of broken glass. First of all, the land that's inhabited by Czechs and Slovaks is given independence, forming Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Second, Serbia and Montenegro unite, and further annex what is known today as Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, and Vojvodina. <coughs> this thing to Vojvodina. form what is familiar to many as the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Yeah. Trentino was ceded to Italy, of course, because it's pretty easy to deem the people there Italians. Transylvania was ceded to Romania, and from then on, vampires became a Romanian stereotype again. <laughs> Galicia, which is inhabited by many Poles, was ceded to the not-yet-complete Polish Republic. Yep. Finally, of course, the kingdoms of Austria and Hungary are now two separate entities. Now into Bulgaria, they were able to hold on to their Serbian land for the duration of the war, but now they're forced to give it back. To Greece, they lost their direct access to the Aegean Sea. They were also required to shrink their absurdly large military down to a size of just 20,000 men and pay for the, all the stuff they broke. And yes, they did break Serbia. So guess who's getting all the money? The Ottomans' fate was not entirely sealed until a few years after the war. An Armenian state was given independence, while Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, and Kuwait were given to the British, and Lebanon and Syria were given to the French. Yep. Greece, France, the UK, and Armenia attempted to wrestle down the Ottomans for the next couple of years until they eventually settled and formed the modern-day Turkey. And for whatever reason, there's still no Kurdistan. <laughs> Quick fun fact, it was proposed to see Armenia to the United States as a mandate, but this idea was denied by the Senate. All for the sake of democracy, I suppose. And now for Germany, who for whatever reason everybody thinks started the war. Their Polish land, of course, is given to the newly established... Yeah, I would like to hear your opinion. Uh, do you think that uh, the Germany started the First World War? And is it like... And we all know, like, it's mainstream... And uh, everybody blamed Germany after the First World War that they started it. But who started it? What do you think? Just your opinion. Like, was it Serbia? Was it Austria-Hungary? Was it Germany? Who was it? What do you think? Just your opinion. No, no correct answer. Established Polish state. Poland is also given access to the sea through the Polish corridor. Yep. This, among many other things, becomes very controversial later. Some land a bit south of this is ceded to Czechoslovakia, who also really recently emerged. The region of alsace lorraine is returned to France after it was taken from them in an earlier yep. conflict. Germany also ceded Memel to France, a region near Lithuania, but later on, Lithuania took it from them because it makes sense. Balkanization. To Denmark, <laughs> northern Schleswig was ceded, despite them not doing much the entire time. <laughs> the city of Danzig, near East Prussia, was given independence as a free city-state. Yep. To Belgium, who so sadly stepped on, received the regions of Eupen and Malmedy. And we're still not done. Far away across the ocean, or more specifically in Africa, the German colonies of Tanzania and Namibia <laughs> are both given to Britain, Cameron and Togo were split Africa. between the France and the UK, and the regions that are today known as Rwanda and Burundi were given to Belgium. But I'm still not done! In the Pacific, Japan, who honestly was just here to make yeah, a profit, gains German Germany's problems. Pacific holdings above yeah. the equator, plus a small colony that used to be part of China. Because Japan, in the First World War, Japan was actually on the side of the, uh, of the Allies. 
and so they took just the German ter uh, territories there because it was uh, undefended and uh, Japan was a rising military and industrial power. Uh, it was actually the first country to, to industrialize in, in Asia. And because of all that industrialization and, and the need for more material and land, they started to, to become more and more imperial and ambitious to, to expand themselves. So, yeah. German Samoa was given to New Zealand, who at the time was still under British control, and the rest was given to Australia, who was also a British subject. Yep. Back into Europe for a moment, Germany's military was stripped of all things unnecessary for defending themselves. They were also required to remove military presence from the area west of the Rhine River. The area captured from what used to be the Russian Empire was to be returned, but since Russia doesn't exactly exist right now, the areas are evacuated and eventually chaos sweeps back into them. Finally, the last salt covered nail in the open wounded coffin, Germany is now required to pay 132 billion marks, yeah, which in today's money is about 442 billion dollars. Even though the treaties were set in stone and managed to please most of the Allies, there are still millions of people who are overall not Just happy not since Italy. the conclusion Just of the war. Bulgaria lost even more, Germany had fallen, and now Austria and Hungary are weakened on their own. But even then, Italy still is a bit picky with what they earned after fighting. Soon enough, someone way too out of his mind is going to show up and try to recreate the Roman Empire. This was a very controversial yeah. treaty, and if you can't tell, Germany lost a bit too much for their own good. Their economy falls, and the German people are now angrier than ever before. They are starting to feel separated from each other after losing swaths of land. As the years progress through the quite literally depressing interwar period, Germany seeks to restore its glory. We'll give Europe until the 1930s before some Austrian painter comes to power and decides to make his dream come true. Austrian until then, painter. enjoy how relatively clean this map of Europe looks. It'll get even messier in the next 20 to 30 years. So what lesson can we even learn from this? We cannot pin the blame on just one side exactly, and it's not like there was an obvious bad guys and good guys, yeah. at least not in continental Europe. Rather, the blame will be pinned on the main causes. M standing for militarism. Everyone was militarized, let's be yeah. honest. Everyone constantly had their armies fully armed and ready, and were about ready to snap at each other at any moment. A standing for alliances. Regardless of whether or not people thought assassinating Archduke Franz Ferdinand was such a brilliant idea, Russia only came to Serbia's aid because they had already established that they were good friends with each other. It isn't like Germany hated anybody either, they had only decided they needed to support Austria-Hungary because they had made an alliance with them. I standing for imperialism. Europe was getting crowded, but everyone still wanted to take stuff over. This applied to everyone. Italy liked taking over the Mediterranean, France and Britain liked taking over Africa, Serbia liked taking over other Serbs, and so did Bulgaria. Everyone was bound to take <laughs> over something at some and point. So does and standing for nationalism. Most of this can be traced back to the one guy Gavril Princip. He had the plan to make a point of uniting all the Serbs by killing Franz Ferdinand, but of course, Bulgaria had essentially the same idea in mind, which is what drove them to beat the tar out of Serbia. Now that we know that not one side in particular was to blame for these four years of everybody dying, is there still any lesson we can learn besides overall not being a militarized, allied, imperialist nationalist? Well, there is one, and it applies anywhere. Just stop killing each other, it helps! <laughs> He's done. Nice, <laughs> nice video. I like I like creators on YouTube. They're they're always so um, creative <laughs> uh, with with all the country balls and, and, and animations and so on. So yeah, as I said, um, I didn't want to. How long is this video? Eighty thirty eight minutes. That's gonna be forty probably. Yeah, um, I didn't want to make this video two, three hours long. I said like the things that may be more interesting and that uh, people could look up uh, later on. But if you have any corrections, as I said, comments on the topic, interesting information, whatever you know, just let us know in the comment section below. Um, and yeah, as always, see you until next time.